Hello everyone, thank you for joining in today. Uh, I'm Priyanshi and on behalf of Art and Artisans Group India, I like to welcome our guest speaker, Arijit Bhattacharya. Arijit is an artist and independent curator, currently living and working in Weimar, Germany. His practice revolves around contentious narratives of resistance through social engagements, design interventions and lecture performances. His artistic discourse is deeply rooted in the dissecting trajectories of socio-political history and its implication in cultural practices. His major works, to name a few, have been part of institutions like Koch International Art Artists Association, Photokat Mandu, Koche Benale, Unita Jeju, Serendipity Arts Festival, and Goit Institute. He did his master's in visual arts from MS University Baroda and is currently pursuing MFA in public art and new artistic strategies at Bauhaus University, Weimar, and he is teaching there as well. So here I present Arijit Patacharya. Thank you, Arijit, for being here with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, asking me to develop this because this is the second time I'm uh, going to talk about it. So I'm pretty excited and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, from my behalf, like everybody, whoever is here is uh, kind of very close to me and the new people whom I'm yet to know. Uh, thank you for joining. So I'll start the, the presentation. Please let me know if you can see the presentation, like, uh, oh, can yes. anyone see it? Yes, yes, yeah, okay. can. Yeah. So one of the things when you uh, when you leave India, the 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 thing that the baggage that you carry with yourself is that the question of Indian cooking that comes with you, and everybody kind of asks like, uh, uh, can you make curry? How is curry uh, and and stuff like that? So with this question, there is there is always this uh, thing that comes to my mind that uh, I know how to cook. I have been cooking it for a while now, but how how political is our curry? And this is a question that that has always stayed with me. But the first time I I came to kind of know about it that curry is is not only ours but curry is something that is that is for all. Uh, during a protest that that I was a part of in Berlin last year during two thousand twenty uh, January. So I was uh, part of this uh, group, Berlin for India, and uh, and was walking down the streets of Berlin, uh, seeing Azadi, Azadi against the CAA and RC, and uh, holding the banner with someone like Ronak and others. And uh, after the after the protest, one uh, the protest was on Saturday morning, and. Uh, uh, the whole Saturday was kind of revolving around it. And then uh, around Sunday, I guess, uh, we had something called currywurst. And the worst is the sausage, like, like you can see here, uh, this sausage. And uh, the there is a tomato ketchup kind of thing that is poured on it. And then the curry powder is kind of used as a seasoning. So I was pretty shocked that why is it called as the why is it called as currywurst why why is it because of the curry powder or is it because of something else and uh, i was thinking that where does curry actually come from and and something that stayed with me was like the immediate answer that 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 was with me was that maybe curry comes from southeast asia the indian subcontinent or 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 something like that maybe that is where curry originated and hence, I, I took a small journey around curry to find out that where curry is up from. Like, is it is it from this uniquely beautiful subcontinent that, that I and many others like us come from? Or is it from somewhere else? Uh, while, while again, coming back from Berlin to my own city where I live now in Weimar, I, I was... I was pretty intrigued by this idea of understanding curry. Uh, did curry change throughout time or, or curry is something that is authentic? It has its own nature. Uh, someone might say that it's a banal thought that, that it is just something like this that, that stayed with me. But another question was, uh, was 
lingering around my mind that like if i can see curry in berlin in a place like this maybe curry is is somewhere else also in the world did uh, how did curry conquer the world like like somehow was it the curry that 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 was the main initiation that changed the world in a way or or was it something that that was uh, made to show influence was it a soft power was it a form of soft power or or was curry conquered first so i i was living in these two questions so this is a, a basic small map of uh, british empire in its full capacity and some of the late 19th century uh, illustrations you can see that the the british uh, man can stretch ab- around the whole african continent stretching it with his leg this is one of a very popular uh, illustrations that i was going through during that time to find out where uh, curry comes from actually because a lot of ingredients that we use for our cooking curry today like okra comes from like which in hindi uh, we call as bindi comes from uh, africa and it was not originated uh, in india it is it is a gift of so called uh, problematic uh, trade that happened between india and africa uh this also then reminded me of uh, transatlantic slave trade i wanted to find out how curry was what wa- was curry ever in this slave trade can we find traces of curry in the in the in the slave trade uh where sh- where should we start from first because during the transatlantic slave trade britishers or the british empire was very much involved in it and uh, they not only took african slaves along with them free people then converted into slaves and then made them go to the so called new world so the old world uh, old world's people were then forced to travel or forcefully put to the new world over there in this in this in this slave trade in this huge ocean of people moving without their will uh, there is a small place called jamaica and i i found curry there i found curry meeting two two cultures meeting together and finding each other in the souls of curry uh most interestingly in this in in this section in this uh in this uh, curry trade in this trade of curry where humans are being tra- when where humans are being forced to go from one place to another uh, to another you, you can significantly find the curry that had originated from southeast asia traveling to jamaica during the british raj and in this situation what is happening is that the slave trade has just been abolished by the britishers and around 1807 and then they are importing indian coolies uh the the laborers uh from india to work in jamaica so when the when the over here when i'm saying india it's not the the india india the, that we understand today over here uh, by india i mean the india under british empire so they were they were transporting coolies from there and was putting them in jamaica and when people are when they were there in jamaica they were developing they brought their own spices from there but with those spices they were also trying to develop their own food because that is how things were in in the pre columbian world uh, like when we say pre columbian world it's a it's a term where we try to understand the world before columbus so in the pre columbian world this kind of uh, movements were there but the the movements were much more free flowing it was from the people from a very in- different perspective than of using human as a material of trade uh, so so we move forward from here and 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 the the indian cuisine that came from uh, southeast asia or the indian subcontinent or the subcontinent got mixed 
with the with the African method of cooking. Over here, you can see a, a leaf, an illustration of a leaf. It is called allspice. That is how it is named. So the so the fruits of allspice, the dried version of it, is used in the Jamaican curry. This is the famous Jamaican goat curry, and uh, how how is it cooked? Jamaican goat goat curry is cooked like when you take you take the seasoned goat, you you take a very young goat and you clean it and then you uh, kind of toss it around the fire. Then you apply the spices and then you kind of saute the onions and tomatoes and then you kind of have this amazing aroma and then you put all spices over there. This 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 little uh, tiny thing over there and then you kind of cook along with it and you develop your own own uh, curry with it. It's it's a very famous popular Jamaican dish, and I I I was very surprised to find uh, curry in Jamaica. Uh, and the Jamaica goat curries during the British Empire was was in a short in a very in a, in a very short way can be understood as a as a how do you say as a conversation amongst two cultures which were again suppressed by the colonial raj and the the next stop where i kind of found curry was in singapore a lot of uh, singapore or or the singapore is this is this small city state which was uh, which came under british rule or british raj around the 19th century and uh, and during that time, a lot of Indian soldiers were uh, in large numbers were kind of living or bought into this uh, Singapore. And while staying here in Singapore by, the, by their own British masters, they kind of developed their own sense of cook, uh, cooking. There is always like in, in both of these cases of uh, Singapore, and also in terms of Jamaica, what I find very interesting is that uh, there is always this sense of belonging that came to people from this idea of food. What, what becomes more interesting for me in this research is that there is, there is a lot of text available in this, uh, in, in this process about finding, finding the, the idea or nostalgia of home through cooking. And Arjuna Appadurai, who also says that food is something that becomes a memory in this process of mass migration. Uh, but is it really about that? Is it, is it about remembering home? Like the, the curry that, that was born in Singapore was something that came from the Chinese migrants and also from the Indian migrants. Singapore was kind of a safe space for the Chinese migrants during that specific time period. And uh, Singapore curry is also some a, a mix of of these two flavors. Where you where you first in the oil you uh, put a paste of ginger, garlic, and you and you season it. And then uh, above that you put the above above it you put the uh, the meat or the fish or the crab. The one that that I found very interesting is the in the is the Singapore uh, chicken curry. The, the Singapore chicken curry does not use the amount of spices that we use, like garam masala and cardamom and others. What it uses is the curry powder, the onion, the soya sauce, and the ginger, the garlic, and the meat. And uh, with this, uh, something also interesting comes up that uh, Singapore was one of the first uh, places that during the 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 Subhash Chandra Bose's INA's Indian National Army or what we know as Azad Hind Fauj's first place that it kind of invaded, took back from the Britishers and was stay made it its halt. And you can find these kind of posters all around it. It kind of says that it has like Urdu, Hindi, and Bangla. In Bangla, it says 
অত্যাচারী ইংরেজদের বিরুদ্ধে অস্ত্র ধারণ করো ওই আসে ভারতের স্বাধীনতা সেনা দল তাদের সাথে মিলে গিয়ে মিশে গিয়ে দিল্লির দিকে এগিয়ে যাও অ্যান্ড ইট কাইন্ড অফ রিপিটস ইন উর্দু অ্যান্ড হিন্দি অলসো সো ইট সেজ লাইক লেটস লেটস গেট আর্মস against these oppressive britishers and uh, let's uh, l- let's lead towards delhi because the the indian soldiers are coming from the east and let's let's march towards delhi and it was also some because of someone like netaji subhash chandra bose this 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 charismatic army a uh, general this this highly educated bengali bhadralok who is coming there and and kind of trying to take take this place and kind of imagining india as a free space a, a, a free nation and it also kind of contributes to the curry uh, this the, these kind of notions uh, this this idea of war this idea of uh, struggle for freedom Uh, also comes in this in this section uh, and uh, after subhash chandra's death uh, the curry kind of developed in its own and the singapuri people thought that like still today things that curry is something that is that is there that is for there to be celebrating about so this uh, this was very interesting i found it out very recently that singapuri culinary anti immigration protest uh uh against uh the people so there were tens of thousands of people in south asian city state uh, said that they would cook and eat curry on sunday of 2011 august 22nd highlighting growing anger over the increased immigration the campaign began after an immigrant family from china complained about the smell of curry from a singaporean indian neighbor's home and local officials brought about a compromise a facebook page devoted to the row after reports were published in a local newspaper has drawn over 57600 members many of who said they were going to they were cooking curry on sunday in a show of solidarity with the indian family so this this also becomes very interesting that how how something as simple as food can become so much more something that we we don't imagine it to be and then from this this uh, travel i i kind of from singapore i found myself in indonesia specifically in bali bali is also the place that i come from i don't know how the the space in indonesia is named as bali and also my hometown bali but i can say that the bali word means uh, in bangla and also in uh, in different languages which generated from ardh magdi it means sand so it it is somehow in bangladesh it is called as balu so bali balu all of these things also kind of remind us of sand but i don't know how it actually happened so we all know that indonesia was a kind of uh, indian colony during uh like d- even before the britishers there was a very strong trade that was happening in, in bali java sumatra cholas rashtrakutas all of these uh, kingdoms they were doing extensive uh uh extensive traveling into these places and they also developed their uh, their specific uh thing and it is pretty interesting that the first culinary house or the or the cooking restaurant in bali was established in 1693 it was a tourist hotel that was uh, converted into uh, so much of other stuff also uh the largest tourists that come to bali are from australia china and india like they these are the th- three main people I was also surprised to know that the in the in the quest of this curry that uh, there is a the third like the the bali is divided into multiple uh, regions or reigns like districts so bali has a district only devoted for bengalis and that was also very very interesting for me and then i understood that when indonesia's this specific part was lately a british colony a lot of uh, bengalis were also 
transported from Kolkata or nearby areas to these kind of spaces because the 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 the, the suppression of la lingua franca that happened uh, through these kind of practices where where something very very interesting in this situation uh, because this this specific uh, situation that that we are in right now is not something that happened within 200 or 500 years this was a systematic situation so to understand it more like i i was looking for more details in 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 bali because bali also along like indonesia is a muslim majority country and are the minority uh, minorities in that specific country and bali is is a space where hindu majority can be seen and uh, it, and also then i found out that bali has a very specific unique dish and uh, a curry and the the curry of bali is called the 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 balinese pork curry it it is it is it is a direct result of the the pork eating uh, tendencies of the south asians which were later on uh, questioned through religion in multiple points and and this is something how it looks like the balinese pork curry it has uh, it is something that one can imagine uh, to have qualities of pork bhindalu but then have like a very interesting salty uh, kind of tangy quality to it and the pork is steamed very well and for this you do not use the ribs but you use the fat around the pork's belly and also the part of pork's neck and the specific parts with more meat and it's more mostly a boneless uh, kind of meat uh, that is cooked and it is also eaten with with rice and uh, i was pretty surprised to find uh, curry over there the next stop for us in in this journey of curry is japan like this was the place that i i was pretty shocked to find curry in like i i never thought that i would ever find curry in japan and but but i somehow found curry over there and I, it was pretty interesting for me to know that curry was introduced in japan again by the britishers and it was something that was very uh, very much because of the relationship that the british army and the japanese army had before the second world war so curry was introduced during the meiji period something like 1868 to 19 or 12 uh, in in japan and uh, it was used to cure the deficiency in japanese army vitamin b1 deficiency in japanese army so pork fish pumpkin beef and crabs and a different seafoods were uh, used for these kind of curry making and in this entire process of curry making what happened was that japan really accepted curry japan became a nation of curry today factually more more curry is eaten than sushi or tofu in japan because curry is understood as a whole meal in japanese uh, society so so this was also very very intriguing for me but i was trying to look uh, look for more more so called authentic dish that is there an authentic uh, south asian relation that can be found in terms of uh, our neighbors in uh, asia pacific or is it something that is only th that is that is not possible for me to find but then i was shocked again uh, do you, this is this is the portrait of this is a group photo of japanese right wing nationalist uh, uh, comrades in a way and over there you see this guy i don't know if my mouse pointer is visible there is this guy whose name is rash bihari bose or rash bihari boshu so this guy uh, free, flees from india during 
uh, during the point of uh, British uh, Empire. And over there, because, because he was very much into the freedom movement of India, and he was, he was trying to put forward this idea of a violent revolution through which India should be independent. And he was also someone who was, uh, who was indulged in different kind of, in, in today's context would, would have been called the terrorist activities. So when he, when he went to uh, Japan, he, he, wanted, uh, he wanted to form Indian National Army or INA with, with different Japanese uh, uh, delegates and also the right-wing nationalists. And he was kind of successful with it. And then he kind of later on gives the baton to Netaji, Netaji Shubhas Chandra Bose, who then commands the army and then goes to Singapore. So this guy, Rajbihari Bose, uh, developed a specific curry. He was basically a curry seller in, in Japan. And uh, Rajbihari's curry is known as the Nakamura curry because he was selling curry in, in a bakery called Nakamura Bakery, which is uh, still there. And it's a curry which has almost every form of meat and every uh, form of seafood that, that you can imagine. But interestingly, this is how it looks like, like the, the, the authentic uh, or so-called Nakamura curry. And... Uh, in, in this whole process, there is, there is something that, that always uh, makes me question that the Britishers uh, kind of took curry from their play, from India or that specific region of subcontinent and kind of took it forward to so many other places. But where, but how did Britishers consume curry? Or, or curry really conquered a uh, British empire. But actually curry, curry conquered a British empire before it being conquered by the British empire itself. Uh, during the British East Indian Company, uh, uh, during the British East Indian India Company's reign, there was something very common that there will be this babu or there is this uh, British uh, worker who would would be in charge and then he would have like a Khan Sama, a Baburchi, like a, like a Nawab, he would also have these kind of people and all of them are Indians. And then they would uh, serve him all the delicacies that he desired for, but along with that, uh, they would also serve them Indian food. And uh, this is what I'm saying that, uh, just keep, keep in mind when I say India, don't uh, think of it in the context of today's India. Uh, this India that I'm seeing is the British India and it's a bigger geopolitical territory. And, and because of that, there are so many things that come into the cuisine of, uh, that comes into the formation of curry. So in this, in this process, Britishers started to consume these kind of curries. There, there are nannies uh, who are, uh, who were who were kept for the British children to to be taken care for, and they were also somehow traveling with the Britishers, which had a very horrific story that there were a lot of uh, nannies who were from uh, India, and then they were put into the sea voyage into the ship, and then they would travel to London, and then there were no one who would take care of them, and uh, they would just strangulate over there and they would just stay there. But coming back to the point of curry, uh, with, this, with this specific idea of having Indian food and then when these British officers and when they were going back to, to their to UK, they were kind of uh, taking curry with them, with these Babuchis, Khan Samas and, and all of these servants that they were having. But one of the most unique most unique things that you can imagine in the British curry, that the curry that that so-called the Anglo version of curry, where the the two worlds meet, is it 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 does not have the 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 tanginess of the curd or, or the the curd that we use. It has apple, 
so britishers wanted something from their home they they didn't want the curd to be the central element of that that you know thickens the the gravy of the curry or or this watery liquidy form of that curry they wanted something like apple to you know uh, downgrade the spice to to suit it for the british environment to 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 make it easier for consumption so apple became the ingredient that was used to make it feel more interesting uh, for britishers and then again the next thing that becomes even more interesting is that in india there is this huge amount of spices that are used the most people think that indian or, or the south asian curry that that is produced is only based on garam masala but it is not there are major seven spices which can be grinded and concluded as garam masala but this list can go up to 32 or 25 or more than that there are so many different spices that come with specific spaces like the 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 so called curry from ahom or assam is is not is not a typical bengali curry or a typical bengali curry will not be a typical uh, curry from chatisgarh a typical chatisgarhi curry will not be the typical curry from andhra so there are different spices blends herbs that come together but british tongue couldn't accustom to all of these so they made one amazing innovation that is called the curry powder so curry powder is a blend of multiple small spices and then it looks like a yellow form of this uh this specific powder and then that is sprinkled on the food and which i found in berlin that that curry powder being put on the wurst or the sausage and that's how it got its name the the curry wurst so this is generally how uh, one apple uh, chicken curry would look like in the in the british uh, plate something that is seasoned well something that is that is soothing to that the to the british tongue something that is not at all spicy but but one thing that people misunderstand specifically in west are about indian curry is that or or the curry from south asia is that uh, the curry is not about spice or it is not spicy it has multiple uh, layers to it multiple tastes and those tastes become very important and i think it's it's because of this uh, how do you say a difference that has happened throughout the year years because of climate and so many other reasons uh, the the britishers do not enjoy curry in in its form that is found in multiple parts of uh, south asia but the the person who actually got curry to uh, britain was uh, was this guy his name is sheikh din mohammad Uh, this guy started this indian uh, restaurant um, around 1830s in uh, in in the heartland of london and and he was pretty famous uh, but this guy also introduced shampoo the the word shampoo or the shampoo comes from this idea of champi or champu which means head massage so this guy introduced the idea of shampoo to uk and then rest of the world kind of got shampoo he was also called the herbal doctor and uh, sheik din mohammed introduced a lot of things uh, also with the curry the, he added murg masalam he added uh, vegetarian khichdi so many other things but all he was remembered for was curry and also the the first uh, the curry that was also brought to to the larger european context was by the the 15th sikh regiment uh, and and other sikh infantries during the first world war and this is a uh, an image of the sikh infantries uh, who were see, who are seen with the children 
uh, of Europe in a European village. And this is quite fascinating that the coolies, the, the, the sipais, the, the fighters, none of them are kind of remembered in this grand narrative of the World War. And I, I feel kind of disappointed by looking at this, uh, at this film called Dunkirk. Uh, because Dunkirk Beach, when the, this this huge attack was happening, and the so-called British Army was being annihilated, there were thousands of Sikh soldiers from the so-called crown jewel of British Empire uh, were brought to that space. Uh, they were they were fighting for the British sovereignty. And they, they, they were never shown, a brown body was never shown in that, uh, in this grand narrative. Even though this movie from Sean Mendes, in, uh, which was uh, released last year called 1917, did a better, so-called better representation by showing one brown and one black in, in that image. But, but then you also understand that uh, what, what, it was actually going on and what is still going on. Who holds the power in terms of representation? And uh, coming back to Curry, that now, now it becomes very interesting that uh, some of them do not even recognize Curry as something that came from somewhere else. They would call one Indian or South Asian looking person in the street as Curry Muncher which is a slur towards anyone coming from South Asia because you cannot munch curry, can you? The curry is something that is, that is mixed with the rice or used with the chapati or bread and you eat it, you, 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 you take the aroma with, 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 your, with yourself, it's, it's, it's something else. But coming back to the curry again, moving forward from there, some, one person becomes very interesting and important is Winston Churchill in this, in this saga of uh, curry. Because uh, Churchill thought that in this grand narrative of a, the, the Second World War, uh, what was important was the freedom and the liberation of Europe and not the lives of the people who generously gave curry to them or from whom curry was taken. Uh, a, a dish that was very prominently served in the, in the British canteen. And also just a fun fact to going back to Japan again, the Japanese soldiers almost even today, every Friday are given curry, the Japanese form of curry or the Nakamura curry as their staple. Churchill's uh, this kind of idea about saving Europe led to something like this, uh, the Bengal famine of 42-43. People were desperate. People were desperate to survive. And there were dead bodies around Kolkata and around different places. People thought coming from uh, villages and coming to, coming to the city would save their lives. But this is not. This is actually what we know today as Khidirpur, Khidirpur Lane. And there are dead bodies and vultures are uh, devouring these dead bodies. And this is again, those kind of ethnographic photographies, which kind of um, make us look at these bodies, these, these so-called curry eating illiterate Bengalis or people from South Asia who, who, are, who, are, who were forced to starve. Around 3 million people died in this, in this narrative of uh, saving the Europe and starving, the, starving a specific province. And, uh, what we understand today about this specific issue that uh, the Bengal famine was obviously an anthropogenic crisis, a crisis that was man-made, that was completely developed because of how people responded. And, and uh, coming back to these, the, the, these images, some people say that the children who are shown in, this, in, in these images, they are already, they were dead. But they just wanted to show how these how these kids were also being carried. And uh, by the time around 43, 44, how when Bengal kind of healed, 
the 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 east and the west part of india was 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 forced for partition a partition i i i do not know uh, was was something that was a part of larger religious identity and also this this colonial politics that they they were enforcing to there are these huge amount of people traveling from india to pakistan pakistan to india and and by looking at people and their clothes and their and their their spoken language people are murdered butchered in this whole uh, journey britishers thought that it would be best to to give india away to the people after the second world war because they understood that it cannot be managed anymore and indians also wanted their freedom and they were fighting very hard for it and in this process there was something that was implanted or that that we carried forward with us our so called division undermining uh, undermining the 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 so called uh, collective uh, presence that we had once and we can all and kari traveled from here to there and there to here kari traveled from pakistan to india from india to pakistan and and also and also from bangladesh to india from india to bangladesh this is my grandmother's uh, passport like which was called the india pakistan passport during that that time because my grandmother uh, and my grandfather both my uh, like both parts of my uh, family or the ancestors come from east pakistan which is now today known as uh, the bangladesh so this is my grandmother's uh, passport where she in 1956 she is uh, traveling to bangladesh with her children and then she comes back uh, to india again uh moving fast forward from there trying to trace curry back in 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 1990s uh india goes through this huge change of economic liberation that india wants economic liberation because it cannot uh, cope up with this this socialist economy in 1989 the berlin wall falls and also this uh, the the soviet empire kind of collapses and socialist economy needs to go out of the of the chain of of the indian uh, political or social situation and what comes in or seeps in is this idea of neoliberal economy and mcdonalds with its hindi pronunciation comes inside india and uh, curry takes a different form then uh, there are mac maharajas uh, and and so many other things that are developed that that are so called uh, neoliberalified curries along with the or the indian cuisine that stayed that that is continuing to be consumed and served uh, in this situation of uh, our new world but in the end some one question stays with me who's but whose curry is it who owns the curry is it the 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 is it is it india's is it pakistan's is it sri lanka's is it bangladesh's is it burma's is it uh, sorry is it myanmar's is it uh, nepal's is it bhutan's whose is it who who owns the who owns the curry today uh, in in this search i i i was looking back into the most obvious possible sources and something comes to my mind in this whole process is the demolition of babri masjid in in 1992 when the uh, when the when the when the babri masjid uh, kind of was demolished in the in the 6th of december uh, this this demolition of babri masjid kind of erased not only how we understand curry but also our relationship with curry the whole idea of frying onion in the oil in the pan comes from the mughals and that that memory that historical memory we kind of try to erase in this in this new form of india we are 
we are continuously trying to erase this historical idea of how curry was actually born and one after another we kind of in this process are are going forward for removing our own identity uh i i i'm also in this whole process i think of pehlu khan who was who was killed on the on the day on 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 the on a daylight because he was a dairy farmer and the people accused him of uh, as, as someone who who was going to slaughter cows but beef eating was always a part of indian cuisine was a part of indian curry making how suddenly things were changing why is it changing for whom is it changing is it is it because of the mcdonalds that was introduced the one that is trying to propagate one version of a country through different structures that are wants to that wants to allow people to consume in one specific way or is it by someone else we cannot deny the amount uh, that that curry has received from the moguls the the soul food biryani that we consume not curry but but the soul the soul biryani we consume today comes from the mughal cuisine and specifically something like butter chicken something like murgh masala any of these all of them uh, all of these gravified curryfied things all of them come from the moguls and also in this in this grand narrative of of curry what we should not forget that south east asia is a formation of class caste and gender politics caste becomes extremely important uh, on how we understand curry the 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 idea of olaf eating or or insidal part of a of an animal or roots different kind of roots that we consume was something that was that according to manu smriti was something delegated only and only for the dalits and only and only was made for the dalits and this huge amount of culinary uh how do you say delicacies in terms of curry that had evolved from the dalit cuisine or the adivasi cuisine we cannot deny it so whose whose curry ultimately is it is it the brahmin's curry is it the is it the curry of the man who wanted to free india the raj bihari bosh's curry is it whose curry ultimately is it i was still thinking of the question during the 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 last year when the corona virus struck and i was thinking in these lines then our prime minister uh, declared um, how do you say a lockdown one lockdown that had cost hundreds of thousands of people to move within 4 hours of notice people were were moving uh from the place that they were working the migrant laborers because if you understand the indian economy you will understand that it does not provide people stable jobs at least 83.5% people work in in informal economy and these huge amount of people were forced to leave their cities and and one one specific incident had struck a chord to me like it was very distressing for me to to look at this 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 train accident where 11 people were killed on the on on this specific uh train line and and all i could see along with their clothes were ingredients to make food to in, ingredients to make curry and and i and this question of whose curry is it stayed with me because most of these people come from the from the farming sector who who cannot farm throughout the through, throughout the year or they have very less amount of land so they go out and work in different cities so so whose whose curry was it i understood the curry 
in in this whole whole conversation of curry one thing that i was missing that the curry belongs to the farmers it is something that came from the farmers with their ingredients people who developed a civilization around manjadaro and later on on in in different uh, river based uh, areas these these farming communities developed this form of curry which can be found in the archaeological findings also with in the the earliest form of curry in the entire indian subcontinent or this the southeast asia is found in the in the teats of the bones that are found from mahanjodaro like one of the earliest river based farming based sectors and it completely disheartens me to see how our farmers today are fighting to have simple rights for selling their own food in their own or, or their produced uh, farm products in their own material as there are a lot of people who are not only from india but also in this talk for our from documentary called uh, nero's guest uh and uh, there uh, this this very famous uh uh farm journalist he's saying that uh, he he's saying that uh um, that one european cow is more privileged than an indian farmer this is actually very painful for me to also understand and uh, reconcile in my in my own self so for me i understood that the curry is somehow of the farmers in the end the one who creates the things but later on today morning when when i was almost uh, finishing that with the with the last slide something also i understood in this whole process that there is no such thing as curry the the cultural transactions or transitions uh that happened in this process around the different parts of the world in jamaica in singapore in bali in in japan in europe in africa all of these places this 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 form of curry or this specific thing becomes everyone's because if we look at the word curry it actually comes from this tamil word curry which is a specific dried leaf or a form of sauce and then in bangla we have something called torkari torkari means vegetable but it also means cooked vegetables or any form of cooked food then we have in gujarati kadhi which is also a form of uh, a milk based sauce then there are multiple forms of these kind of things and what actually happened is in this process through understanding curry that i was i was appropriating a british power structure i was appropriating a british colonial structure the food from southeast asia cannot be ever be understood in the layers of curry it's it's a vast world it's it's a it's a world that that is con constantly in flux in itself it's a world that that kind of changes itself every moment so there is no such thing as curry there is no authenticity to it when when there are migrants there when there are immigrants or when there are group of pakistani uh, is living somewhere in germany with with this form of food they kind of remember where they come from it is the same thing with the with the people of maybe jalandhar going somewhere near delhi working there and cooking their own specific sauce based food that is either being eaten with rice or form of indian hand bread or or from or any or in any form then i was asking myself then how how did i think of curry for me whom curry belonged to like who reminded me of curry in the end for me it was my grandmother 
curry or any form of cuisine specifically when you are when you when we are thinking of the south asian or southeast asian context it is the woman in this entire gender and 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 this this struggle of power it is the woman that kind of produces it for the family every single day and for me i remember having curry for the first time from my grandmother and that is how i would like to remember it that my curry is from my grandmother and there is no authentic form of curry there is no such thing as curry and curry will all if there is something called curry it will always be political it cannot be seen without its politics thank you thank you so much arjit yeah. it was a lovely session so now i think we are open for q and a um so if anybody is interested in asking any questions or comments or like unit a dialogue uh, please just unmute yourselves and yeah just go ahead it also be very nice to see uh some of the faces it was a very informative <laughs> lecture i didn't know much about this kind of food until i came to germany so it's very interesting to see um your perspective of where it comes from so thank you thank you thank you for attending and having the food also yeah i also had to say that it was very informative like i didn't have any clue about this that it was uh in jamaica or in japan and that it was even more consumed in japan than than food that we think the japanese would eat and i also understand what you mean about like your perspective of how this comes from your grandma like this mm -hmm. memory uh, because i would say in puerto rico we also have some um similarities of the origin of some spices um or foods and mm -hmm. i think we always want to remember it we always attach it to the family because um everyone changes their their way of cooking every time so it's not like a um settled uh, thing that passes over the years it always evolves mm -hmm. thank you oh, i don't i'm i'm still trying to like uh, form the question but it's again around uh this idea of uh, what is what is authentic like mm -hmm. in terms of identity or maybe also like in this context food mm -hmm. and how uh, in this need to find that real authentic uh, you know culture or self mm -hmm. we are undoing or ignoring so much transactions and like uh, give and take that has happened uh, and how the identities have also evolved uh, let's say hindus muslims or uh, different cultures sharing always happen and mm -hmm. it's never like you you don't stay the same person uh, forever like it, it always evolves mm -hmm. and the sharing i think at this point we are completely negating it and we are again trying to find the authentic or maybe uh, unadulterated uh, self of some sort and food is becoming like this uh, uh space of uh, conflict contention in india where the uh, what one should eat uh, mm. is hitting right at the heart of uh, you know i mean beef is something uh, it's so cheap uh, that people forget that the reason why uh, you know uh, people eat beef is because it's so affordable it gives you uh, all the proteins and required uh, you know uh, uh, supply of uh, vitamins proteins and you get it easily it's not like you want to eat meat and that's why you are eating beef uh, but mm -hmm. it's just like an affordable uh, a dish and and to say that uh, belonging to this uh, like you just can't eat it because we worship it or like xyz reason mm -hmm. uh, and that's then entering this domain of being per, like personal choices mm -hmm. and it's interesting how you also bring everything to personal like it's mm -hmm. you start from like this larger question of where 
it originates and you are trying to trace it but then it again comes back to your own house like that's where the mm. memory also starts from you associate it uh, from uh, your memories and and sharing also happens like your uh, you see your grandmother cook it or like you eat her cooked food and uh, you know it's passing from one generation to another uh, and now with the advent of like the use of internet you can obviously like borrow it from here and there and experiment but there used to be a time where these things were passed on from one generation to another and it was very like a uh, community based or like you know mm. uh, uh, mm. limited to families so i think uh, uh yeah the the politics of food uh, is quite uh, fascinating how do you now uh, tackle this question of food and like where does it originate even if, if it's even a question that we need to answer and like accept that things have kind of evolved and and you know uh, anthropological like uh, uh, questioning is one thing but yeah how how do you address this question now that things are becoming more and more political and and people are now entering into each other's personal spaces so uh, i yeah i don't even know if i put up a question or it's just like i'm trying to just say something uh, but yeah. yeah i i i think i i kind of understand what you are saying and and that's that, that is one of the reasons that that i'm also kind of doing this this lecture or the, or this kind of uh down the memory lane kind of conversation it's because i think that this 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 transaction that is that used to happen or that is still happening uh for in between so many people and uh and now how we are kind of violating each other's space in these kind of forms and formations is something very alarming and that's why i i always want to bring it back into the realm of uh, you know practice uh, because there will always be someone who will uh, write a column about it there will always be someone who will document it from the perspective of witness and in this whole process there will be the one who is entering the personal space and the one who is whose personal space is being violated and over there as we people who who are kind of in the position to do something uh about it from our own practices uh as artist gives us uh how do you say a kind of tool artists architects authors it it kind of gives us a tool to you know question these kind of violations that that kind of happen in our own daily life and one of the reasons that i also brought it down to personal or 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 self is also the point that you were mentioning that how our personal spaces are being violated uh and how how it's it's not only about the food then anymore it's about how you look like why do you have a beard why do you why do you wear clothes like this uh, so all of these things uh, things are are something that that are there i guess i don't know if i if i am able to answer your question but this is what i thought of saying when you said what what you said but uh, thank you you were just thinking through the situation and like i don't think there is any specific answers to this but yeah just thinking out loud yeah that's all we can do i guess that's all we can do without uh, appropriating or without you know uh, subjecting another person in some other way i think that's all we can do we can this this is meant to meant for us to think so that's all i can say um i was hi everybody i was just first of all thank you it was really great to hear you say all of that and uh, having traveled to britain recently from india the whole curry craze is so it's very relatable and it's yeah amusing um yeah i just found it very interesting how um i that's how i saw it maybe i'm completely wrong but you talked through the um presentation uh, sort of presenting a perspective and when you reach the end you you were sort of like okay i think i'm appropriating curry as what the colonizers or the britishers have done 
and so i think it was yeah how like yeah maybe how did you or when was this point of realization in your study that you had where you were like oh i'm actually going this way but you still decided to sort of keep the whole study and not just dump it and you know move in the correct direction so yeah. i think there is i think this i happened when i was super drunk last night and 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 i was thinking that oh my god this talk is going to be horrible what am i doing with myself and that's the moment of enlightenment for me like i think i felt that okay uh, how if you have made a mistake how do you accept it how do you how do you move past it the best way is to not undo that you have not done a mistake the best way is to share that you have done a mistake and to let more people know that you you have walked this path and that it, it can be complicated mm-hmm. so that is what what meant for me to find out that you know like uh how to accept it first in myself and it's really hard for me to say to so many people like showing this amount of slide and in the end telling them i'm sorry i was wrong i was telling you something that i understood was complicated and problematic but i think that is that is that is what i i feel makes it or or makes uh, these kind of conversations more interesting and important finding our own problems in what we say how we appropriate ourselves also mm-hmm. so that is how, what i would like to say maybe i did not if i uh, answered your question or not no, 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 no. this is what i felt yeah i think you did that greatly i think yeah really I, yeah of course yeah no that was really great and i think you accepted your no mistake i wouldn't call it but no i really like that you realizing something about your research and then sort of the way you went back to it very graceful <laughs> thank you <laughs> but yeah thanks thanks a lot everybody actually i i kind of forgot that there was a japanese slide that i made about how japanese curry are you know divided into multiple parts like spicy very spicy little spicy kind of thing and when i am presenting right now i forgot shit i i forgot to put that slide <laughs> and it was really uh, scary for me that ah i missed a point but yeah it is also pretty nice for me to realize these kind of mistakes adhika are you typing something yes she is it seems that she's typing okay uh would like to read out her what she wrote till now she wrote like i have sort of gotten stuck on how you ended the talk with curry is everyone's because there is sense of reclaiming what curry is not just as how is yours or ours or theirs but to reposition there is the difficulty difficult to accept creation power related appropriations of curry i think uh, uh, there is the difficulty of uh, to accept creation power related appropriations of curry i think it's more of a comment uh, than a question mm. okay like you, you are maybe kind of trying to say that the end of the talk kind of gives away the curry's authority to everyone and does not uh, leave it to one specific group of people but it as uh, it belongs to everyone in in a way is that what you were trying to say okay thank you um yeah it's quite fascinating how uh, yeah food for thought curry and and just food in general how political it is mm-hmm. so it's worth thinking you know addressing the prob- problem of whether food should be politicized or uh, let people just have what they want be it veg non veg or whatever in whatever form mhm uh, yeah thank you thank you uh, sankit bhai for this uh, specific thing the, this this is some this is a question that always stays with me should food be politicized or is it already too politicized so 
uh, this is this this is something that stays with me. But thank you so much, Priyanshi, for uh, giving me this space, and thank you everyone. Thank you, literally everybody who came and joined this uh, this talk, and yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. Thank you, Arijit. Um, and thank you all for joining in. And I hope everybody stays safe in these times. So yeah, bye bye. And if you ever want curry any time, you can always call me. Most of you have my number, and people who do not have, you can always ask, and I can cook for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Arijit. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.